Dr. Sumi, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Today we'll talk about reservoir quality and um, mostly about what the components of reservoir quality is. And the uh, four little barrels here uh, I'll talk about, uh, but these are the components. Uh, we'll need total rock volume, we'll need the reservoir sand volume, we'll need the net pour volume, and then of those pours, what portion is filled with water and what portion is filled with oil or gas. Uh, this is a uh, terms of use slide and basically uh, the material that I have developed and present uh, is, and is available on the uh, IRIS uh, website is intended for uh, use by students or for students, not for people who are already uh, employed, especially in the uh, oil and gas uh, sector. So uh, I'll give a brief overview. I'll talk about what's included in reservoir quality, and then I'll talk about the uh, components, uh, which were uh, shown uh, in a, a four sketches on the uh, uh, title slide. So reservoir quality, at least when we're in the exploration phase, we want to know as best as we can if there will be good quality reservoir rock where we're proposing to drill. And good quality reservoir means two main things. Uh, first, reservoir rocks have to be present, and then the reservoir properties have to be good enough that we can produce hydrocarbons out of them. And uh, usually what we're looking for is rock with uh, high porosity and high permeability. Porosity is the pores, and that's where the hydrocarbon uh, fluids would be stored. And the permeability is how interconnected the pores are, and that uh, tells us uh, how easy or difficult it would be to uh, extract the hydrocarbon from that rock. Ultimately, we want to know how much hydrocarbon is in that potential reservoir, and then of that quantity, what portion, what fraction, what percentage can we produce? And that would lead us to an estimate of the ultimate recovery uh, often abbreviated EUR, estimated ultimate recovery. So the presence, uh, are there rocks that could form reservoirs in our area? The data that we'll use to try to answer that question, um, we would uh, use whatever well data that we have from the area. And so I might, uh, from a regional study, uh, looking at uh, available wells, uh, know that the uppermost Jurassic is a sand-prone interval. There might be outcrops on the flanks of the basin, and so uh, if we have reservoir quality rocks exposed on the edges of the basin, uh, then we would want to try to uh, correlate that in towards the center of the basin and uh, consider the possibility that there could be uh, facies changes either to uh, improve or decrease it. Uh, and seismic data is one way that we can use to uh, connect up the wells we already have with uh, wells uh, that uh, we're proposing or carrying information from the outcrops on the edges of the basin into the area where we propose to drill. The available well data may allow us to build some log cross sections and uh, either extrapolate or interpolate uh, available well information to the area where our prospect, our drill location, is uh, positioned. If well data exists along with the seismic data, then we want to try to develop good well seismic ties. And we'll use seismic facies analysis. Uh, I talked, I uh, think, two lessons ago on the ABC geometric observations that we'll make, and then also seismic attributes, which was the topic of our last uh, session, to try to predict the environments of deposition and then infer where reservoir quality rocks may be present. So reservoir quality relates to the ease with which we can produce oil and or gas from one or more wells. Uh, the two main factors, which I've already mentioned, porosity, the pore space between the rocks, and permeability, the connectedness, if you will, 
of the uh, individual pores. There are various ways that uh, we try to predict reservoir quality uh, from very simple methods to more complex methods. Uh, one of those methods is to use analogs to find sands that are from a similar environment of deposition, have the, about the same age and have about the same depth, and use uh, porosity and permeability information from these analogs that could be in basins quite removed from where we're proposing to drill uh, to uh, make some uh, uh, very simple predictions. We can use uh, local data to plot porosity and permeability as a function of depth and make predictions uh, using best fit lines to those uh, porosity versus depth plot and the permeability versus depth plot. And then we have uh, various software packages that are available we, that will allow us to model the burial of the reservoir unit, uh, try to uh, predict its temperature through time, also its pressure history, and uh, use that to try to make uh, predictions uh, somewhat based on uh, uh, the equations that we have available as to what the porosity and permeability would be. So we want to get as much information as we can so that we can estimate how much hydrocarbon is in place. Normally we'll make three predictions. We'll make the most likely volume estimate our best educated guess. Then we'll be a little bit on the pessimistic side. Uh, it might be as small as a certain number of volume. Uh, and then we might uh, be optimistic and say it could be as large as uh, some particular volume. And so management uh, these days are usually not interested in a single uh, porosity permeability estimate or prediction. Uh, they would like to see a range. How good could it be? How poor might it be? Later on, uh, we will have to consider how much of the volume of hydrocarbon that is in place in the reservoir can we actually count on bringing up to the surface uh, through however many wells we might uh, be drilling. And that's the estimated ultimate recovery. So how do we get hydrocarbons in place? The first step is to estimate the volume of the total rock volume. So if we have a particular uh, uh, a place where we want to drill, a prospect, uh, we may have one or more possible reservoir targets. Let's say we only have one. For that reservoir, what we would like to know is how uh, it changes in thickness over the prospect area and uh, also uh, what type of an area do we think it extends over. So with the, uh, the thickness and the area, we can estimate the volume. I'll be talking uh, in terms of uh, some real numbers, uh, the case of Barracuda, which is the field that a lot of the exercises uh, associated with this uh, course uh, has used uh, up through lesson 24, and uh, we'll continue to use that. And so the first thing we want is the total rock volume. So to a first approximation, we could map what we think is the area aerial extent of the trap. Uh, if we're doing this uh, with uh, computer software, uh, all the interpretation software packages has a planimeter. So you can uh, digitize a polygon around the area that you think uh, encompasses the trap, and it will tell you what that area is uh, in acres or uh, square kilometers or uh, square miles or square feet, whatever unit you prefer. We have to estimate how far down dip those hydrocarbons extend in order to get the area. I'll talk more about this in our next lecture, lecture 26. Uh, if we are using thicknesses in units of milliseconds to a travel time, uh, then we have to convert it into an actual thickness in uh, meters or feet. And if we have velocity data uh, from a nearby well, uh, that would be uh, the way in which we can go from milliseconds to uh, meters. And then we combine the hydrocarbon extent with an average thickness, and we can get a total rock volume. 
and the units there would be uh, cubic kilometers, or in the English, a lot of times people use acre feet, or it could be uh, square feet. So in the little yellow box on the right, the field area times the average thickness gives me the total rock volume. The next thing we need to know is what's the pore volume. And so uh, if we start uh, with the reservoir sand volume, we can use porosity uh, either um, uh, from an analog or predicted maybe through basin modeling. Uh, and that's uh, porosity is the volume that re represents the pore space. So porosity, uh, usually represented by the Greek symbol phi, uh, varies by depositional environments. And so in the case of Barracuda, uh, part of the field is in a shore face environment, and the porosity there tends to average around 20%. If it's in a delta plain environment, the porosity at Barracuda averages about 18%. And if it's in a fluvial environment, uh, it averages about 16%. So we have to take our total volume, we have to remove what is not reservoir, silts and shales, and then there may be some poor quality sands, that's what we consider non-net, and then we get what the net reservoir would be. If we use porosity times the uh, total um, good sand volume, that would give us the poor volume, which in the little cartoon would be the green portion of my uh, barrel of oil. The hydrocarbon uh, volume, we start with the net pour volume, and then we have to know or estimate or predict uh, or use an analog for the hydrocarbon saturation. What portion of the pour space is going to be uh, occupied by uh, water? We call that irreducible water. The hydrocarbons can't move all the water out of the rock when it's um, um, migrating in. And then uh, the remainder would be either gas or oil or a combination of the both. So 80% uh, hydrocarbon saturation would mean that 80% of the pore space, the green on the previous slide, uh, would be hydrocarbon and the remaining 20% would be irreducible water. So for Barracuda, the hydrocarbon saturation uh, we now know from uh, drilling wells and producing the field is about 90%. So if I know the net pour volume, I multiply it by the hydrocarbon saturation for Barracuda, I would use uh, 0.9 or 90%. That would give me the volume of hydrocarbon in the reservoir at reservoir conditions. Uh, next, we're ready to consider uh, trying to produce those hydrocarbons. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we have to worry about is what the uh, recovery efficiency would be, since we won't be able to drain every molecule of gas uh, or oil. And as we bring the hydrocarbon from depth up to the surface, the uh, pressure is going to uh, de decrease and the temperature is also going to decrease and that will uh, cause the uh, gas or the oil to expand. So uh, we have to uh, estimate or predict or use analogs for what the recoverable uh, amount of hydrocarbon would be. For uh, Barracuda, uh, we're talking about gas and the recovery efficiency uh, is assumed to be about 70%. Um, many factors go into predicting whether it's going to be 50% or 70% or 30%. Uh, it depends largely on the plumbing that's within the reservoir, uh, not just the permeability of the sands, but how sands are interconnected and how there might be uh, shale layers or silt layers that impede flow. Uh, trying to go into all the ways in which pre we predict recovery efficiency is beyond the scope of this course. And so uh, we'll just assume that our reservoir engineering friends uh, can help us uh, give, get an estimate uh, of a reasonable number for that. And then we also have the volumetric expansion uh, with Barracuda, we're bringing gas up to the surface. And so the pressure drops and the temperature drops and that causes the gas volume to increase because of the uh, expansion. So in the right uh, lower yellow box, if we know our in-place hydrocarbon, 
we have an expansion factor and a recovery efficiency, and that will tell me the recoverable volume, how many uh, cubic feet of gas I would expect to be able to uh, deliver to the surface and then uh, send off to our customers and make some money. So uh, this is a seismic line through Barracuda. Uh, the Barracuda One well is located right here. Uh, the magenta is the top of the reservoir. The red is the base of the reservoir. And uh, this is a figure, figure one from the exercise, if uh, you uh, uh, want to do that. And what I've done is I've broken this cross section into a number of columns labeled A through T. The gas water contact is roughly in the position of the dotted red line. So above the red line, the reservoir uh, pore space is filled with gas. Below that line, the pore space is filled with brine or salt water or water, whichever uh, of those three terms uh, you prefer. So this tells me that uh, on this cross section, the gas starts at the uh, E to F uh, column boundary and extends over most of the way through S. So that gives me a width, and then at each column, I could come up with an estimate of what the thickness is. Uh, this is two-way travel time, so that would be in milliseconds. Uh, I could use a velocity then to convert that uh, into a feet or meters. Uh, I have also shown here uh, with the red horizon that that's a horizon on which I datumed or flattened the seismic. And so that uh, takes out the post-depositional structuring uh, of the unit, and it would show me the uh, red to magenta unit. Uh, uh, it does vary in thickness a little bit, uh, but it would be something more similar to what the original depositional uh, layering and uh, dips would have been. In the exercise, you have this computation sheet. So here's uh, 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 column A out through uh, T, and a lot of it has been filled in. Uh, column I, J, and K is what you would be asked to complete in order to uh, do the exercise. And so what you would do, uh, I've already shown, uh, you draw the gas water contact on figure one, the seismic line. You can then measure cumulative reservoir width uh, you can get the thickness, you can convert the thickness in uh, milliseconds to uh, thickness in meters. Based on the environment of, a dep of deposition, you can assign a net to gross and a porosity so that you get the um, uh, amount of uh, hydrocarbon uh, pore space, or I'm sorry, uh, total pore space. Uh, you can get the cross-sectional area, you can determine the rock area, then you can determine reservoir pore area and then the hydrocarbon pore area. And since you, uh, we're only using a single cross section, uh, we're talking about areas instead of volumes. The computer can do all of this uh, if you have um, either a 2D, 2D survey or a 3D survey uh, and you can uh, enter information uh, over the area of the, the trap and, and potential field, and it will calculate all the volume numbers for you. Without computers, it's a little more difficult to do it manually, and that's why I have you only look at one cross-section. And then for the exercise, you sum all the values in uh, uh, columns A through uh, T, and that would give you the units of hydrocarbon in square kilometers. So uh, that concludes my prepared remarks. I'll turn the discussion back over to Dr. Sumi and see if there are some questions. Great, thank you, Fred. Um, we do have a question from Atif. He asks, thanks a lot for such a nice webinar. As you mentioned, as the hydrocarbon will move upward, the hydrocarbon will expand due to a decrease of temperature and pressure. How does hydrocarbon expand when the temperature? How does hydrocarbon expand when the temperature decreases? Well, uh, I can't think of any uh, 
place where the reservoir um, temperature and pressure would be less than surface temperature and pressure. Um, even if it's a really shallow field, uh, the temperature uh, will always be a bit higher um, to uh, significantly higher, and the pressure will always be higher as well. And so uh, typically, um, I would turn to a reservoir engineer to try to get values that would be appropriate for the prospect that I would propose drilling. Okay, great. Carlos asks um, a question related to the last uh, uh, webinar lesson on seismic attributes. Sure. Um, um, is there any other attributes used on specific situations? Uh, certainly there are. Um, there are probably 200 different attributes. And uh, management always asks, is there one attribute we can use so that we always know where the oil is and always where the gas is? And uh, the resounding answer to that is no. There is no single silver bullet attribute that uh, will be uh, uh, reliable every time. Uh, it's almost on a case-by-case um, -case basis. Um, units um, in the Miocene in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, different attributes would be valuable there as opposed to uh, uh, Cretaceous um, uh, rocks in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, something that works in the Gulf of Mexico may or may not work in uh, offshore West Africa and uh, things in the um, uh, North Sea uh, will be uh, probably different from things that you would use uh, off of South America. So typically what, has, what is done is uh, interpreters will uh, extract various seismic attributes. They'll display the attributes uh, usually in a map view, and then they'll see if there seems to be any sort of geological or fluid distribution pattern associated with that. Uh, next uh, lesson on direct hydrocarbon indicators, uh, I have one map in there uh, that uh, seismic amplitude uh, uh, displayed in map view uh, uh, gives a wonderful uh, indication as to the distribution of the hydrocarbons within the reservoir. So sometimes amplitudes work, sometimes uh, amplitude does not work. Great, thank you. Um, Carlos asks a question related to today's lesson on reservoir quality. Um, how do you quantify lateral porosity or permeability heterogeneity within the reservoir and include it on the final assessment of reservoir quality? Sometimes we can use different seismic attributes to try to understand how reservoir facies is going to change across the field. Uh, certainly, if there are thickness changes, we can use seismic to uh, help understand that. Um, sometimes it is more difficult to figure out uh, what sort of uh, variation in porosity there could be, and it's even more difficult to use seismic uh, in particular uh, to try to understand how permeability might vary across a prospect. So. Um, we do as good of a job as we can. Uh, there are some uh, fields and prospects where uh, we have a pretty good handle on how uh, porosity and permeability uh, change. If we're in a producing field and we have uh, 20 or more wells, uh, we would have well information that would tell us how porosity and permeability vary. And that certainly is important when we start building a reservoir model and trying to predict how the field is going to produce into the future. Uh, in the exploration stage, uh, we probably don't have any wells in our prospect. Uh, we might have a nearby uh, well in a similar uh, setting uh, with a, a discovery or a field, and we might be able to use that as an analog. Great, thank you, Fred. So that's all the questions that we have for today. Oh, one more. Um, John asks, how reliable or precise is the estimated in-place hydrocarbon volume in reservoirs? And why are dry wells so common in exploration phase? 
Okay, two que there's two questions there I, that I catch. Um, one is how accurate are the numbers? And usually the accuracy depends on the quality of the data that we have. Uh, if we have uh, moderate to poor seismic data quality, we don't have any wells in the area, uh, those estimates are um, not as, uh, as uh, accurate and, and precise as uh, certainly we would like to have them. Um, it's a matter of uh, using the data that we have at hand uh, to come up with a, as best of an estimate that we can. Uh, certainly, there are examples of prospects that have been drilled, and the estimate was uh, only half the amount that actually was found, or there's other examples where the, um, the estimate, uh, the predicted uh, uh, reserves are a lot smaller. And there certainly are cases where uh, we think we have a wonderful prospect, we're expecting oil or gas in economic quantities, and we don't find anything. Uh, and um, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but I would say worldwide right now, when we're drilling exploration wildcat wells, uh, our success rate is probably about one out of three, 33%. And so we do still draw, drill a lot of uh, dry holes. Uh, there are various reasons why we might drill and uh, it turn out to be dry. Uh, in some cases, um, we have the promise of uh, it could be uh, an extremely large discovery and management, uh, even though they realize the chance that it's going to be successful might be, let's say, 10 percent. The reward, if it does come in, is so great that they're willing to, uh, to uh, risk uh, one chance out of 10 well in order to, uh, to test the uh, possibility of having a super giant field. The other reasons uh, I have offhand for dry wells is that the, uh, the seismic data quality is not as good as uh, it uh, needed to be or uh, somebody has been overly optimistic uh, about uh, the chances of finding something. So none of the wells that we drill in exploration have 100% uh, pr predicted success rate. Uh, I think about 90% would be about the highest any well would have, and that would, uh, that would be for a well um, in a basin where we've already made a number of discoveries and uh, it's a very similar uh, prospect to things we have already drilled and made discoveries on. Great, thank you. Um, Arif asks, um, how effective is seismic in capturing a reservoir heterogeneity? Uh, the heterogene uh, heter heterogeneity in the reservoir uh, would be predicted if we have a reasonable expectation that the seismic attribute variation is related to uh, reservoir quality variation. And so in a, in a general sense, oftentimes uh, we can use attributes to identify where the sweet spots will be. Um, and um, then uh, away from those sweet spots, we would expect reservoir quality uh, to be less. Now, whether that sweet spot is 15% um, uh, porosity and 100 millidorsies, or whether that sweet spot is 5% porosity and uh, a microdorsey, um, that, uh, that becomes uh, an important question to try to, to uh, answer. Great. Um... Arif asks, in deepwater sands, there are short length reservoir heterogeneity trends. Um, how could a sedimentologist be of help in this scenario? If the, um, if the prospect that is uh, being proposed to being drilled, if we get the environment of deposition correct, and let's say we are in a uh, fluvial environment, uh, sedimentologists um, may be able to help find appropriate analogs 
And so they may be able to say that um, this uh, myosine uh, fluvial deposit that you're thinking about drilling, uh, it should have similar sedimentologic uh, reservoir facies characteristics as uh, these uh, six or eight or 20 fields uh, that we have uh, more solid information on. And so by using an, an analog um, argument, uh, we can sometimes uh, benefit from uh, detailed sedimentologic information, either from known fields or from outcrops, and come up with appropriate uh, parameters in which to try to uh, quantify how effective the reservoir will be. Great. Thank you. Um, so that's all of the questions that we have today. That was a really great Q&A period. Um, so with that, we'll see you guys next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern uh, when we're going to talk about direct hydrocarbon indicators. So see all of you then. All right, take care, everyone. Hey, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sumi, once again for uh, organizing and uh, moderating our discussions. Absolutely. All right. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.